So I said last night that we were going to do it, and we are doing it right now. We are discussing the Twitter pundit Matthew Iglesias. Um, I'm sure he doesn't uh, think of himself as just a Twitter pundit or a Twitter personality, but this is the way that, that I view him, and this is most likely uh, the way that history will view him to the extent that he's anything more uh, than a footnote uh, to my videos. Um, but anyway, whenever I discuss people on this channel, right, it, it's never just to talk about a person, right? I'm not really interested in people all that much, but I am interested in why uh, certain people maybe become popular, what the uh, uh, existence or mere presence of someone means culturally, right? And Matthew Iglesias, so he's been a writer for the past 20 or so years, um, a, a pundit when it comes to, I don't know, politics, maybe some light cultural issues here and there. Uh, but he's he's been at it for a long time, right? He's a, a he was the co-founder of Vox, sold that, runs a very popular Substack, maybe the most popular Substack right now. And he had he, I guess you could ostensibly say that he's a a liberal, right? I wouldn't really call him a left winger in any kind of substantive way, but uh, he he definitely has uh, uh, those liberal tendencies, right? Uh, both uh, the good and the bad of of everything that that entails. And I came across this tweet that he um, sent out. This was maybe a couple days ago. So it's August 10th now. This is August 8th in reference to the Inflation Reduction Act that was recently, like Manchin came out and he said that he was going to support a cinema supporter, right? They were sort of waiting for that to happen. So it's kind of like a, a trimmed down version of what Biden originally wanted to pass, right, which is what we're going to get to uh, later on, right? That's also an interesting question, how every single Democratic Party platform gets winnowed down, right? It's already kind of um, uh, not enough, right, in many important respects, but they do progressively get smaller and smaller as time goes on, right? Goal posts move, things shift around. And of course, people that don't necessarily have a, a stake in some of these issues, especially when it comes to um, the future, let's call it, uh, they, they they would come out, right, in defense, right? They'd come out in, in celebration. And I mean, we've seen this for a long time, right? Uh, Iglesias has been writing long enough that you, 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 you could see how uh, this played out in some of his takes uh, I have back in like 2002, 2004. And of course, there's inevitably that kind of backtrack they have to do. But People in this society, right, the, if you get sort of high enough or you sort of start high enough, right, he was kind of like born into a, a media family. So in many important respects, uh, pretty much everything was uh, handed to him. But people in, in, in that kind of scenario, right, they rarely fail out of life. They tend to fail upwards, right? So despite being wrong on any number of issues, um, there's never any kind of punishment, right? There's only uh, a punishment depending on, on who you are. But anyway, so this was the tweet. I guess some people are going to be disappointed when it turns out the world adopts enough policy to keep climate change to survivable levels without radically overthrowing capitalism or abandoning economic growth. But personally, I think it's good. And I found this tweet very interesting because of what it says, because of what it doesn't say. The words that it uses, and I'm not sure to what extent Iglesias himself is conscious of the words that he's using. I'm not sure even to what extent he frankly even understands climate change, right? Because um, when we go back in history to look at some of his other takes, uh, in retrospect, but even, I mean, back then, like as a teenager, right? He's a, he's a bit older than me. I was a teenager when he was writing some of the stuff, Um it, it, it does, it, it's very odd that someone that has a reputation as a policy wonk, right, as an information sponge who keeps releasing day after day after day after day, right, new material, it's very strange to see a tweet like this, right, because it's very imprecise, it uses words incorrectly, you don't even know exactly what is, what is being said here. And yet some of it you could even accept, right? You could even accept as, as a kind of given reality, right? So just to sort of frame this uh, discussion, right? We're gonna, we're gonna go further and we're gonna uh, talk about some of these other wider issues, but to frame the wider discussion, I'm gonna use this tweet. And this is what I'm gonna focus on here. 
So first of all, he uses this phrase, right? Uh, the world adopts enough policy to keep climate change to survivable levels, right? So right off the bat, I already start to kind of doubt um, Iglesias' uh, understanding of uh, climate change and just kind of maybe long-term trajectories in general, right? Human beings, societies, how maybe species evolve and how they uh, uh, survive, how they die out. Um, because... There's nothing that I see on the planet now that suggests human beings will go extinct, right? Or that they will not be able to survive climate change. The fact is, even if we literally do nothing right now, period, just flat out do nothing, or even let's say worse than nothing, let's say we reverse the very sort of like minimal things that we've done to reverse climate uh, damage. And we just say, you know what, fuck it, we're going to go straight into more fossil fuels, right? Uh, endless growth, right? We're going to keep upping the ante again and again and again. We're not going to lead the world on these questions, right? We're going to encourage everybody else to behave in the way that we behave. Even if we go full hog into that trajectory, human beings are going to survive, right? They will survive, right? They're not going to die out. Now, granted, um, perhaps the uh, 10 uh, or rather like what is like 14 billion or so at 2100 projections that we're getting for a uh, total population, right? Um, end of the century, maybe some of those things won't play out. But generally speaking, human beings will survive and there will be many, many of them. Right. Maybe they will all be living in Canada and Russia and Patagonia as the three places that are habitable at that point. But they're going to survive. And some of them, uh, perhaps even people like Iglesias, they're going to thrive. Right. When you think about a, a mass kind of, you know, climate refugee crisis, the first people that are going to be taken, you know, in by Canada or by Russia, let's say that Matthew Iglesias, who uh, very much sort of prides himself in his big brain and sort of nerdiness. Right. Um, uh, let's say he learns Russian, right? He would be one of the first people perhaps invited, right, uh, to go to Russia, right? It's not going to be some, you know, guy in the middle of Africa somewhere, right? It's not going to be some uh, uh, uneducated Indian male, right? It's going to be uh, it's going to be the Maddies, right? It's going to be uh, the other uh, neoliberals, right? He he has sort of uh, taken the neoliberal shill moniker, right? He was uh, insulted in that way a few times, and he he now wears it as as a badge of honor, so. People will survive, right? And, and Matt will survive, and uh, uh, I will probably survive in this situation too. Um, so we're not talking about survivability, right? We're not talking about a mass extinction event of human beings. We're not talking about even a, a depopulation where we're merely a shadow of who we were, right? We could, you know, I could easily see, like, even just uh, in those like two countries or whatever, you could easily have everybody living in high rises. Right, a billion people, maybe even two billion people. You know, don't even have to put a precise number on it, right? You don't, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself in that way. Um, and the reason why, by the way, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself is uh, as we get into some of these climate discussions, uh, there is uh, this interesting set of studies coming out about climate chaos, right? How at a certain point, given that global warming is nonlinear, right? Right, we have a absolute frames of reference, right? One degrees versus two, three, four. Uh, but global warming is nonlinear. So eventually what ends up happening is things that are somewhat predictable now, once you start going up to one, two, three, four degrees, lots of these systems totally become chaotic, right? And they become unpredictable. And they start behaving in ways that um, we might have to sort of uh, engage in just pure patchwork behavior, right uh, a patchwork policies to deal with things that just keep keep getting thrown at us in, in ways that um, we have to react to right as opposed to prepare for right but again just uh, I, I do find it interesting that he begins with this kind of totally misleading sense of what's going on right um, he is sort of uh, trying to reduce, what the cr criticisms of the Inflation Reduction Act are, the criticisms of the uh, uh, Paris Accords, right? Um, the criticisms of pretty much, you know, anything that most uh, Western or frankly even non-Western uh, powers have done to sort of mitigate climate change. The criticisms 
are not right explicitly issues of survivability. Now, granted, when it comes to some of these folks who are, uh, you know, like climate activists or whatever, some of these climate groups, they do talk about mass extinctions. They do talk about, you know, we will not survive, blah, blah. But, you know, all of that is uh, essentially a, it's just a means of getting people on board with uh, supporting what really what the stakes are, right? Because the stakes are as follows. If we reach something like four degrees of warming, which uh, if we don't, for example, mitigate it by two degrees, uh, I believe like some of the kind of like fat tail, you know, statistical analyses of um, uh, what might what might happen, you know, on the so-called like fringes uh, of these questions, um, it's something like there's like a 20% chance of uh, hitting something like five degrees of warming. But just to put four degrees of warming into perspective, from my understanding, maybe I'm uh, I'm wrong at this, but th- th- it, th- this seems to be like there's enough consensus here that uh, um, we should talk about it like more openly, right? Four degrees Celsius of warming does entail that everything south of Montreal is essentially, I don't want to say uninhabitable. I mean, we have, you know, groups uh, living right now in the Sahara, right? We have people living in all kinds of places that seem impossible uh, to live in or places that I would consider totally undesirable. But generally speaking, everything south of Montreal becomes supremely undesirable to live in, right? It's the kind of situation where maybe you have uh, either mass, mass deserts or some kind of analog where everything's just filled with like, you know, solar panel material. Maybe uh, there's like a new means of like generating energy. So uh, uh, many of these places that people don't want to live in in the world, uh, they're going to be used to generate energy perhaps in a new and sustainable way. But these are the stakes that we're talking about, right? We're talking about a massive depopulation and we are talking about human beings living just in a few places very far north, uh, a few places very uh, far south, and maybe you have uh, some communities in between, maybe you have some biodomes, maybe you have some cities that are kind of like Dubai or whatever. Um, So those are really the stakes that we're talking about, right? We're not talking about survivability. And the reason why Iglesias is using survival as the metric is because uh, on some level he must understand that the current plan, right, for the climate, and also another thing that people don't know is uh, the, the the recent Chips Act that was passed that also has a fairly uh, significant climate change provision. Now I'm going to get into what I mean by significant or good or good enough, right? Uh, th- th- these are all very sort of subjective questions depending on the object that you have in mind, but. The reason why he's using a phrase like survivable is he must understand that whatever is being released by Biden, whatever he's frankly even being released by by China now, who has, uh, you know, more than double the average spending that we have on on climate change mitigation. He knows that that is not enough to avoid some of these worst case scenarios. Okay. Now, maybe we don't hit four degrees. I saw one study that I think was probably uh, pretty much spot on that that said, you know, maybe at this point, the worst case scenario is 3.9. Frankly, I'm a little uh, nervous when I hear those kinds of pronouncements simply because we've had these pronouncements in the 90s and the early 2000s and the 80s, right, when some of the stuff started becoming a little bit more mainstream. And uh, surely, right, um, uh, uh, little by little, all these things that were not supposed to happen just yet, you know, we all hit them and things tend to accelerate, right? Because uh, world ecosystems, guess what, behave in ways that are fairly unpredictable, right? We don't even have a good handle on how to properly eat, right? There's still so much controversy about whether or not putting certain fats in your body is going to kill you prematurely, right? We can't even figure out that, despite the fact that we literally experience it every single day, right? We eat every single day. I'm personally a, a fan of reading, you know, various like you know nutritional resources. Like I've been a fan a long time, right? Anybody that follows this channel knows that I used to be morbidly obese, so 
I had to learn how to cook, right? I had to learn stuff about food. And I quickly realized early on that, you know, there's definitely some basics that we could sort of do, right? That we need to hit upon in terms of human health, but there's a lot that we simply don't know. Now, imagine that kind of human ignorance extrapolated out into ecosystems, into climate systems, right? This is, it's simply beyond us, right? To, to uh, understand some of these things, right? We know the basics, we know what to do, what not to do, um, but ecosystems are tough, right? Climate change is tough. Extrapolating outwards is tough. And the reason why I would say this is again, uh, people like Iglesias who would pride themselves on their knowledge or whatever, they've been making pronouncements for a long time. And a lot of these pronouncements, right, uh, in terms of the optimism has not really, uh, 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 you know, they have not really borne themselves out. So that's the first part, right? He knows full well that the issue is not survivability. The issue is, are we going to mitigate some of these worst case scenarios in the way that we don't have to deal with billions of climate change refugees, that we don't have to deal with insufficient living space, that we don't have to deal with, you know, everybody now is just purely in a high rise, um, somewhere in a small little corner of the world, right? Those are the stakes. I'm sure that he's aware of this. I think consciously or unconsciously, right, this word is doing a lot of work here that is tricking a lot of his followers because he does have a ton of followers, right? This is a big name. But he's misleading a lot of people just by using this very, very loaded, baggage-heavy word. All right? Now, the second part. Without radically overthrowing capitalism or abandoning economic growth. Now, here, here's the thing. Like, uh, I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to concede that even in some of these worst-case scenarios, let's say that we do get four degrees or even higher of warming— Right today, I, I saw a scary study that indicated that five degrees of warming uh, is is uh, very much on the table as well um, at this point. Right, given the trajectory that we're on, but let's just assume four degrees, three point five degrees, whatever. Again, don't ever get too specific because you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. These are these are uh, oftentimes uh, unknowable quantities with unknowable effects. You want to be somewhere in the ball, ball ballpark, but don't get too crazy about it. So. Even in these kinds of like worst case scenarios, I can see many, you know, hypothetical worlds and universes where capitalism survives just fine, right? Entrenched powers and entrenched interests have a very, you know, powerful effect uh, on, on any kind of long term trajectory, right, uh, of any kind of society, right? Uh, power has a way of maintaining itself, right? Especially if it, starts to control the sort of levers of what people need, right? If, if they become totally uh, dependent upon, no matter what's going on externally, right? Power just sort of keeps itself, right? Uh, an example that might uh, make uh, Iglesias a little bit upset would be the fact that the Democratic Party, right? Despite the fact that they haven't really substantively done very much for for black americans for a very long time i mean you know after the uh, 2008 collapse um black americans essentially had you know 20 30 years of wealth accumulation which is already like just a tiny fraction of white wealth but they had even that you know level of wealth accumulation totally obliterated for many years and by the time that obama left office um uh not, you know, you can't say this about every person, obviously, but there's tons of medians within the black community where they never return to that kind of like early 90s parody, right? Um, and despite this fact, for whatever reason, you know, black Americans are still very, very committed to the Democratic Party. Now, granted, in 2016 and again in 2020, that is starting to change, right? And that's going to cause some difficulties for Democrats down the road. But we don't have anything in sight, right, like FDR provided, right? The reason why uh, black Americans shifted radically to the Democratic Party was they assessed the platform of FDR, right? I believe it was a 1936 platform. Um, and they said, you know what? We don't accept the Democrats are any uh, less or more racist than, you know, any other party. But we're going to take some of these, you know, economic boons, 
right? And and we're going to go with this party because this is what's being offered to us. We haven't had something like that for decades now, right? And yet entrenched powers, right? Because Democrats, you know, they're not going to cut welfare to the extent the Republicans do, right? They're not going to say, at least publicly, this like totally grisly, insane, inane shit that we see from Republicans, right? They're not going to make people go insane in that same way. So, you know, you sort of go with what's second best. Uh, uh, you, you don't want that spigot cut off. So you vote for the lesser of two evils, right? And this is how a lot of people uh, operate. And entrenched powers understand this, right? So an entrenched power, whether it's a Democratic Party now, you know, vis-a-vis -vis black Americans, or an entrenched power such as, you know, the capitalist class uh, in, in, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, the northerly climates, right, a uh, hundred years from now, they're going to have a means of sort of subsisting, right? Um, uh, when, when it comes to like revolutions, uh, you know, I'm not against this idea that we might have some sort of revolution that comes along, but I'm also very pessimistic in the sense that people are very sort of, e like if, if they have just like a little bit of something that allows them to survive, get some kind of minimum of dignity, Right? If they could just like fuck around their phones, if you give them games, if you give them superhero movies, they might not want to do anything other than just continue existing, right, and not be bothered, right? That's kind of like the baseline human experience, right? That con con conforms very nicely with human psychology. And entrenched powers have a means of like existing, right? And, and I could see like even if these entrenched powers are the ones totally responsible for these policy failures, all these promises, no, 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 trust us, little by little, we're going to keep climate change survivable, right? And then, of course, like a century from now, see, see, I told you, you survived. Now, granted, yes, 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 you were a refugee. You had to leave your home, right? You're now in a completely new place. But I did say survivable, and you survived, right? So it's always like that, right? There's always this, um, there's always this kind of like snarky, condescending uh, kind of like edge, to all these, you know, futures are being set um, against the wishes of everybody else, right? They are set from the top down, right? They are set by folks like Iglesias, right? They are the trendsetters. They are the setters of tone. And they more or less do what, whatever they want to do, okay? So uh, to get uh, more specific about like Iglesias and, and his past. So uh, he's a guy that... Uh, uh, Again, like he he was uh, just like Ben Shapiro, right? He's kind of like interestingly enough, he's he's sort of the Ben Shapiro of the left, right? To the extent that I we didn't call Iglesias on the left, but Ben Shapiro is a guy who he wanted to be in Hollywood, right? His uh, his cousin was the was the girl that played Matilda, right? He wanted to be uh, you know like a comic, right? And of course, like if you ever read any of his literary fiction, it it absolutely fucking sucks. Um, not to say that Hollywood is any better, but he probably didn't even have enough talent uh, and enough writing chops, even that sort of like bare minimum standard, right? Um, so he, you know, he went into politics. That was essentially kind of like handed to him, right? The punditry was handed to him in that in that way. Um, and, and Iglesias is the same way, right? He comes uh, from a, a wealthy enough family. I don't know how wealthy. Uh, went to went to uh, uh, the Dalton School in New York City. Right, we're not too far apart in age. I believe he's, he's 41 now. I'm turning 35 soon, and I grew up, you know, on the uh, the very opposite side. Right, he was in Manhattan, you know, uh, fucking around, going to Dalton. Meanwhile, I was in Flatbush. I was in Coney Island. Right, I was going to public school, uh, a public school that, by the way, was overwhelmingly impoverished. Right, if you simply go by things like you know who is eligible and who is not eligible for free lunches, so. I think, you know, if anything, uh, someone like Iglesias, who has essentially everything handed to him, goes to the school in, you know, one of the centers of the world, or right? like Manhattan being like one of these sort of like cultural centers, just completely divorced from any kind of baseline reality, right? Um, completely inoculated against any sort of like goo that might slip into his life. Which is why he's able to have, like, let's go back 20 years here, right, uh, just to stay on the subject of climate for a second. This is something that he wrote in 2004, right, um, back when I was in high school, um, back when I was hanging out in South Williamsburg, Canarsie, um, um, you know, places like Crown Heights prior to white people moving in. 
here he was living in Manhattan. And this is the takeaway that he had from one of the kind of like more egregious actions of the Bush administration. July 5th, 2004. Go Bush, go. Did the president really gut the Endangered Species Act yesterday while no one was paying attention? So I've heard at any rate. If so, good riddance. You'll all yell at me, I suppose, but really, who cares? Species die, shit happens, get over it. Clean air, clean water, lower carbon emissions, I'll get behind that stuff impacts, you know, people. Right? And um, the thing that gets me about this, I mean, there's like a few things. One, there's the kind of like uh, automatic, you know, sort of like a Steven Pinker-esque assumption that uh, human beings are necessarily more, you know, they 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 they, they have a bigger uh, right right to the planet than than anybody or rather anything else does right than other animals do, right? You should not have these kinds of uh, uh, empathies, right? You should not worry about what happens to other species just just from that kind of like you know odd sort of philosophical standpoint. Right. Which I mean, look, people, you know, like uh, p some people do believe this. Like I'm not even going to be here arguing so much about this. Like I'm not even a, I'm not a vegetarian, for example. Right. I can't, you know, sit here and, and, and uh, a virtue signal about like, oh, how dare you say this about endangered species? Meanwhile, you know, I'm eating animals. Right. Um, without uh, that's not to say I don't feel guilty. I do feel guilty every time that I eat a goddamn chicken wing. But um, I don't I don't change my behavior. Right. That, that part of me doesn't change. But what's interesting about this, aside from the kind of like pride that he takes in, uh, you know, uh, being this, uh, you know, this like badass, let's call it, right? Um, I do have a little a photo of him, right? I wanna, I wanna just, uh, uh, I wanna just like put this photo up for for a few seconds, and we're gonna return to it in a little bit, um, simply because uh, uh, just just keep just keep this picture in mind, right? As we progressively go through some of these uh, older you know, missives, right? These missives from the past, right? Right from the past of uh, Matthew Iglesias. Um, so uh, there's the philosophical uh, stuff. But the second part is, if you're going to be a policy wonk, shouldn't you actually understand what the Endangered Species Act is about, right? I mean, in the context of Nixon just doing so much more for the environment, ironically enough, than any Democratic president uh, after him, right? He was a Republican, right? And he uh, uh, left the presidency after so much disgrace. And yet he did a lot more, right, for the environment than, you know, pretty much anybody since. And the, the, the reasons behind the Endangered Species Act weren't just like, you know, we see... Uh, environmental pollution we see all these other problems we see species going species going extinct and we think there is a value in having them around us another implicit goal of this act is it is yet another federal law right that is not easily overturned that becomes a part of like you know the constitutional or rather the, the supreme court record Right, it becomes uh, 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 just like something that is uh, uh, taken for granted. Right, um, that's not to say that it can't be overturned. I mean, like Roe v. Wade was considered a, a done deal for a long time. Many of the uh, justices who said that it's settled law uh, obviously uh, were not uh, being so very honest when they said that. Um, but you you want these sort of like you know uh, laws that try to do a lot because. They're going to have these like long-term consequences, right, in ways that you can't even so easily predict, right? And one of the ways that we had some of these thing, things that he's talking about, clean air, clean water, lower carbon emissions, does Iglesias, who's a policy wonk, does he not understand that the Endangered Species Act was used actually many a time to do these very things, to make the air cleaner, to make the water cleaner, to lower carbon emissions. I mean, this is all interrelated, right? As a purely kind of like legal mechanism, this definitely had profound effects on everything else that he claims to care about, okay? Now, this was an adult writing this, okay? This was an adult who already at that point considered himself to be a knowledgeable policy wonk um, who 
you know, uh, uh, nonetheless is, is, it, 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 and I mean, even beyond the, like the kind of like legal mechanism, right. Um, there's just also the fact that, I don't know, like how, how much do you actually understand the effects of ecosystems, right? To what extent is some sort of like extinction event, like to what extent is that going to affect clean water, right? What if suddenly you have a species that becomes like, like way too overpopulated, right? And you have to introduce all these new measures. Now we have to hunt them. Now we have to do this. Now we have to kill them some other way. Oh, maybe we use a poison that starts to uh, have other rep repercussions for clean water, right? Um, ecosystems are both extremely fragile, but also extremely resilient and also just so interconnected right? They have an effect on all these things, right? Clean air, well, that has to do at least something with trees. Clean water, that has something to do with all the animals within the water, outside the water, right? And ev all the entailments there, right? People, you think this hasn't helped people in a substantive way, right? So, I mean, you know, like, granted, he wasn't the, uh, what was that, like, um, 2004 so he must have been already in his like early mid-20s but you know this is an adult writing this this is a harvard educated dalton school adult writing this right and in a weird way like it feels like you're you're, you're dealing with a child but that's kind of like the point right like i mean like i i have this thing it's a little bit snarky but it's also true right matthew iglesias the limits of private education Right. I'm not sure where he stands in this question, but I would totally ban any form of private education. Well, for the most part, right? like private lessons or whatever, little private schools, you know, you want to go like do your violin lessons or whatever after the fact, whatever. But generally speaking, right, um, I am very, very glad that I went to the high schools that I went to, right? I, I went to multiple high schools, all of them being public schools. And it really let me understand what kind of like the far wider scope of America is like, of what New York City is like. I mean, you could be like Iglesias and just kind of like live, you know, in Manhattan and sort of like uh, be among your friends and just go to Central Park or whatever and not really understand what the rest of New York City is like, what the rest of the world is like, right? I'm very happy that the context of my education also put me, right, taking walks through Coney Island, right, going to places where, you know, People don't look like me where I'm not supposed to be, right? Places where I had to learn lessons, right? I remember the first time I walked uh, uh, through the Coney Island projects wearing a big fucking yellow bandana, cut up eyebrows, pierced ears, looking straight at Puerto Rican, right? You learn a hard lesson very quickly of what to do, what not to do in those kinds of situations, right? But if you're Iglesias and you never really have to learn hard lessons, right? If, if again and again you could fail upwards, right? You could say something like, uh, you know, fuck the Endangered Species Act. Like, it doesn't matter to you, right? Um, and it doesn't matter to you because it, it's all, like, in the abstract, right? It, it's, it's totally intangible, right? Um, you, you will always, in your city, right, you're always going to get really nice, high-quality, clean water. No matter where you live, right, you're going to get that nice water. Other people elsewhere, right, um, that would have been damaged by the erosion of the Endangered Species Act, Right, it, it, it's not within his ken. Right, it's not within his purview. Right, he, uh, Iglesias is protected from these kinds of externalities simply, you know, by virtue of uh, who he is, where he grew up, um, which is uh, why he's able to also write, let's say, uh, things like this. So, uh, Middle East. Right, um, this is also this is back in two thousand and two. So, uh, uh, back back to his credit. So maybe now this is like really early twenties for him. Right. But at this point in my early 20s, I already understood right, a lot about Israel and Palestine. So this is uh, what his take on Israel and Palestine was. Looking at the situation in the Middle East, I think the administration has things exactly wrong in trying to solve the Israel situation as a precursor to moving on Iraq. The only way a negotiated settlement would be possible there is if Arafat feels that his position is weakening. The only way for that to happen is for the other Arab leaders to start becoming less supportive of him. Now, uh, I'm not sure to even to what extent Iglesias like knows anything about Israel-Palestine, but as someone that has read multiple books 
just on uh, the Camp David negotiations and the Taba negotiations, individual books just on those issues alone, I can tell you for a fact that Arafat was not the one that got in the way of uh, the closest that we ever came to any kind of protracted settlement, right, um, in, in the early 2000s, right? Arafat was not to blame. I could easily back this up. I've argued with lots of people about this um, that take the exact opposite position of me and that also like Iglesias, right, that fancy themselves as like information sponges. And yet when you sort of like drill down, like Iglesias' thing is called slow boring, but when you really drill down, to the specifics of what happened during those negotiations. Um, they really have no fucking clue. Like, I would be like bringing up the specifics of like, okay, this was the Arafat plan. These were the ca counter offers. This was the specifics of what was said in terms of like, you know, settling the, the refugee question, right? There, there's, a, there's a right to return that is kind of ingrained in international law. And one of the uh, uh, sort of like thorns inside of Israel is Palestinians have a right of return right now. Granted, in terms of how this gets dealt with legally, right? Uh, uh, no, 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 no one during any of these negotiations has ever said a full right of return, meaning uh, millions of Palestinians now flood into Israel proper, right? That has never occurred. But when I get to some of these specifics of like what the exact numbers were, I mean, does does Iglesias know that Arafat at some point rumored, right, this is just a rumor, but granted, you know, it is worth talking about that Arafat was rumored to have settled on uh, 10,000 refugees as being sufficient, right, to satisfy the uh, uh, claims, the legal claims that Palestinians have under international law in terms of the refugee question. Right, other numbers were something like a hundred thousand. Still, others were something like two hundred fifty thousand. Right, but when I talk to people about some of these specifics and really drill down in a very slow, boring way to make that illusion, um, they really have no clue about what the fuck they're talking about. Right, because they haven't they haven't read those books. They don't care enough. Right, they don't feel a personal stake. Right, it, it, it doesn't matter to them. Meanwhile, you know, someone like me, I literally like found politics largely through things like Israel Palestine. So I have, you know, I, I feel like I have like stakes in some of these questions. So anyway, you know, total ignoramus on on the question of Israel Palestine. Uh, but he goes on further, right? And the only way for that to happen is for our Arab allies uh, to, to recognize that U.S. Saudi, U.S. Egyptian, U.S. Qatar, etc. relations are two-way streets, not just an endless dialogue about what we need to do to prop up the regimes. What better way to show that than to do something they really, really don't want us to do, like, say, invade Iraq? Plus, if we invade Iraq, we can create at least one reasonable regime in the area. If some moderate government gets toppled or just becomes outright hostile, as the worriers always worry, then we can just topple them again and set up some more supportive regimes. Okay, so... Uh, uh, obviously wrong in Iraq, obviously wrong on, on Afghanistan, obviously wrong uh, at the ease with which something could be toppled and then retoppled and then new governments uh, uh, populate and repopulate, right? Another funny thing um, is he he did at the same time uh, say that we should invade North Korea. And like e even if you take like the question of nuclear weapons, you know, uh, out of this equation – and you take uh, uh, China out of this equation, which would never, ever accept such a thing. Russia, which would never uh, accept such a thing by way of China. Um, there's also the fact that uh, North Korea is built up in such a way where you literally cannot do an invasion. You can't do an invasion. And it doesn't matter whether it's air, whether it's land, especially you cannot do a land-based invasion, right? You will always lose that war. It doesn't matter whether in totality America has superior firepower, just like it didn't matter that in totality America had superior firepower in Vietnam or Iraq. And I would go even further and say that as difficult as Iraq and Vietnam were, um, toppling North Korea and winning that war, land or air, would be significantly more dif more difficult, right? Again, even if you take Russia and China out of that equation, right? It would be difficult simply due to the logistics of war, okay? And the funny thing is I remember, like, again, 
you know, little old me, right? Here we have this uh, fancy boy going to Dalton. And here I am, you know, this uh, ignorant kid with a thick New York City accent in Brooklyn going to a school that is supposed to set me up for failure, that is supposed to be, you know, um, uh, some, some, uh, some like, well, I mean, my mom uh, took me out of Brooklyn uh, when I entered high school simply because she was like, oh, you know, I think uh, it's going to be very bad for you. Like, you might like fall into gangs or whatever in high school. This is scary. So this was supposed to happen to me, right? And here I am in this school and I'm just, you know, I'm half the time I'm not going to school. I'm just reading books, right? And I remember one of the most distinct memories that I have reading George Jackson, reading, uh, uh, you know, like texts uh, from uh, the Black Panther Party. And at the time, they would write a lot about Vietnam. And what they would write really stuck with me. They said again and again while the war was going on, before even anybody came to the conclusion that the war was un unwinnable. In the 60s, they were saying stuff like, this war is unwinnable. It cannot be won sim simply due to what happens in a guerrilla war, right? In the jungle where everybody's hostile against you. You could prop up whatever government that you like, right? Uh, to support you. But the fact is you're never going to get any sort of natural support, right? In the surrounding regions, in the places that actually matter. And they had, you know, lots of, you know, uh, complex arguments about this. And it made total sense to me. And upon reading that, I uh, move, you know, I, I was looking at what was happening in Iraq at the time. Like at the time it was only like what, only like a year worth of war. And I thought, you know what? Like this is so obviously applicable to Iraq as well. This is an unwinnable war. It literally cannot happen, right? Um, you know, we cannot win this uh, in any kind of reality, right? It, it will not occur. And I would see, you know, like people on TV, right? Um, and, and another thing was like when the invasion started, I was like, shouldn't you at a minimum get the international community to like at least agree with this invasion? Like if everybody's against you, including your your allies, um, this, this doesn't sound very good, right? Uh, so anyway, um, so like I, I, I was watching all this unfold. And at the same time, I would watch these like media personalities and I would also think about like what the U.S. thought it was doing. And I was thinking like, well, shouldn't like don't they have all these like long term lessons about Vietnam? Right. Um, you know, like all these other things in the past, like sh sh like don't they understand what the stakes are, what the difficulties are? And I mean, back then, you know, I, I was too young to realize this, but now I do realize that, you know what, it, it doesn't matter even what they knew or didn't know. They were going to do whatever it is that they wanted to do because, you know, like the costs weren't so terrible, right? You could have like a few thousand deaths. Obviously, you know, we sacrifice way more than that in any other situation. I mean, Trump was was comfortable sacrificing half a million uh, Americans uh, for the sake of like pretending that COVID didn't exist so that he could, you know, imagine himself like, gliding into re-election or whatever. So if we're capable of doing that, clearly we're capable of sacrificing a few thousand American soldiers, right? We're capable of sacrificing, you know, a, a trillion dollars of value or whatever. But ultimately, it doesn't it doesn't really matter, right, in terms of like winning or not winning, because, I mean, contractors are able to make a bunch of money, right? You're able to sort of at least show the world, just like Israel says again and again during, you know, the past decade of Gaza sieges, right? If you look at what Netanyahu was saying, what uh, military leaders were saying, the theme that emerges is we need to show the world that we still have, you know, the power to repel. Right, we still have uh, uh, the power to act like lunatics, to be crazy, to make others fearful of us. Right. So, in retrospect, if you view it in that way, a trillion dollars just to sort of like prove your point, it doesn't seem to be you know too great of a cost, right? Especially if like you're also willing to you know progressively cut taxes more and more right? Uh, increased debt without actually doing any kind of like uh, serious public uh, uh, investment that would act as a multiplier so you could pay down this debt. Not that I'm like a debt hawk or whatever, but I mean, long term, right? You want to be engaged in logical business enterprises, right? That bring value for the average person, 
without creating externalities such as ruining the environment, right? So in retrospect, like I understand how none of that matters, but you know, it, it was kind of funny that, um, and this is one of the things that really started to build up my confidence as a teenager, that I could see all these hyper-educated uh, snobs, right? And I could see these people on TV, and I could see all these like military personnel, and I seem to have like an answer to things that they either uh, didn't have or they pretended like they didn't have um, as they continued to sort of like reap the rewards. So to Iglesias' credit, I'm not even sure if I want to use the word credit because, I mean, he had to, right? Like he did in 2010 or whatever say that, yeah, I was wrong about Iraq, but it's like, you know, you know, like you, ha like you have no choice at that point, right? So let's see what else he got. Oh, this was like another thing from 2002. Um, everyone's abuzz about the coming clash between the city of New York and the ignorant, dirty protesters who will soon have their heads crushed by the good people of the NYPD. Again, remember what I said, where he, where he was living in Manhattan versus where I was growing up. If he was growing up in the places that I was, and if he had some of the friends that I had, no way could he possibly say that there were the good people of the NYPD. Even if you start with the assumption that there, are such, there is such a thing as good cops, right? The fact that good cops are unwilling to tattle on each other, to stop bad things from happening, to overturn bad policies, to put their foot down, to become whistleblowers, right? Because then their livelihoods get ruined. They get sent on dangerous assignments. Like all those things occur, right? Like, I, I mean, I've said this story before, but like I remember like when I was like in South Williamsburg, I had a friend there once, right? I was a Marxist at the time. He was a, he was an anarchist. And he, he would tell me stories every fucking week about, um, you know, he'd be walking down the street and at least once a week, he would be stopped by the cops. They would pat him down. He, this is a kid that didn't even smoke weed, right? He wasn't even a weed smoker. He would tell, he would take me to like the, the shisha bars or whatever, right? But he wouldn't even smoke weed. He wasn't doing anything, right? And he, he was a good kid, right? He was going to school. He eventually went to college. He, uh, he was, a you know, he had like a part-time job. He was a good kid, right? He was nice. But every single week, he had to deal with cop harassment, right? Other kids that I knew, they had to deal not just with harassment, literally getting beaten. And they weren't doing anything worse than what I was doing, right? And in many respects, they were uh, uh, better than me, right? Uh, you know, as far as like, you know, uh, uh, whatever activities they were engaging in. So already you know by this statement that he, 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 is, he is such a, you know, sheltered child, right? That's the funny thing. It's like, when you go when when you go to Harvard, when you go to Dalton, right, and 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 you have like essentially, you know, an entire life that is sort of like this cookie cutter life, and and everything is handed to you. You really do kind of just like stay a child forever, don't you? Right. Um, you do you do stay a child forever, right? You don't have to grow up. You don't have to think outside the box. You don't have to put yourself into the shoes of other people. Right, and, I, and I'm just talking about NYPD harassment. I didn't even like stop to consider. That's the funny thing. There's so many things going on here. I didn't even stop to consider this thing that he writes, like about the about the ignorant, dirty protesters. I don't even remember what he's like. What was this at the time? Was this like was this uh, uh like anti-war protesters because they knew this was coming? All right, was like something else going on? Like uh, uh, he's like celebrating having their heads crushed. And the reason why I said, let's take a look at his photo and just gaze into his eyes, gaze into his face, and just like try to imagine like what is his personal history? Like was he bullied as a child, right? Is he vicariously trying to live out someone else's, you know, like, uh, or rather maybe his own fantasy of like revenge taking? Yesterday I uploaded a video, right, um, Dostoevsky's notes from underground i was doing a, a long analysis of that right and the narrator there right he considers himself a mouse right the difference of course between that mouse and this mouse or perhaps this tit mouse is um that mouse in dostoevsky right he had like a, a six thousand uh, ruble inheritance which is enough for him to not work and live in the disheveled fashion somewhere in a little hut in saint petersburg but it wasn't enough to provide him any kind of long-term dignity, right? But here, you know, this mouse, 
uh, who maybe dreams of uh, uh, revenge, right? But cannot actually take like like he can't be like a man of action, right? He can't like you know fuck somebody up that you know told him the the wrong thing, right? Uh, uh, may, maybe one day, maybe one day he did accidentally in two thousand and two get that ass on the train, and maybe he fell asleep, right? And he ended up surprise, surprise in Crown Heights, and he was like fuck and this is the last stop now i gotta walk out and maybe take a cab right maybe he's walking down the street and someone says hey white boy and he's like oh fuck right and now he's as a mouse living out this fantasy of of uh uh, uh trying to get his revenge but he can't actually do it right he can't go out and fuck somebody up he sees these protesters these dirty protesters like right? he he himself is clean right remember nice upbringing always had a clean bath always had running water right Dirty to him uh, is an insult in that regard. He can't take that revenge on others, but he could watch the good people of the NYPD, which he sees himself in, right? When they bash someone's skull, right? He sees himself in that and he thinks, fuck, I wish I could do that. I wish that could be me. But of course, right? He's not ever going to become like part of the NYPD, right? I mean, he has a, he has a, a career at this point. Right, he has a, a cushy kind of existence. Right, he's not gonna condescend to the level of even being part of the NYPD. Right, those grunts could do what the grunts do. He's simply going to watch. He's gonna jerk himself off afterwards. He's gonna have a good time in the process. But this is not the face of someone that takes revenge. This is not, to quote Dostoevsky, a man of action. This is a man of exaggerated consciousness. And just like the unnamed narrator in Dostoevsky, right? This exaggerated consciousness is so exaggerated, right? It is so exaggerated that he's at this point totally divorced from any kind of reality. Let's just like finish uh, the rest of the see what else he has to say. More interesting than the fact that these people suck, however, is the end of the Worker-Student Alliance. Regardless of what one thinks of the anti-globus actual program, they had accomplished that elusive alliance between activists and the real live working class that was missing in the 60s. The, 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 just the idea that he would even utter in any kind of way the words working class. I mean, this, like, this, is, not, this is not your life, boy. Like, talk, talk about something that you actually know. Right, which by the way means not war, not Israel, not climate. So even what you can talk about is getting progressively slimmer and slimmer. But please talk about something that you know. The war, however, has revealed the deep seated anti Americanism that was lurking in the student protesters all along and the hard hats who wanted to see protectionist policies to protect their jobs aren't likely to play along anymore. I mean, like, it's easy to say in retrospect, right? But isn't this just, like, so fucking shameful and embarrassing, right? That that this could have been said. Um, again, lucky for me, like, I, I do feel nice, at least, that I feel like, you know, my conscience is clean, right? I was never pro-war, right? But, um, you know, like, it, it, at the even at the time, though, I knew that this was absolutely insane, right, to have these kinds of perspectives. And, uh, um you know, I, I do want to say that I hope uh, his conscience like eats at him, but it, it honestly doesn't matter. I mean, like, who who cares, right? Who cares uh, what what he personally thinks? But again, like just 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 think about you know think about the inner mouse, right? Living uh, in the podpolia, right? Zapisky's podpolia, right? Living under the floorboards, eating dirt, right? Whatever is like thrown to him, like gazing out, right? Uh, the exaggerated consciousness preventing him from being a man of action. All right, so you know, all he gets is the masturbation. Anyway, so I'm going to uh, stop being cruel, and I will now talk about specifically the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. First of all, I feel a little a little dirty even talking about, um, you know, like even calling it the, the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, you know, every administration, no matter who we're talking about, is coming out with like names for all these bills or whatever that are just kind of like propaganda, right? And the propaganda here is that this in and of itself would somehow re reduce uh, inflation um, unless you really tax it out, right? You're, you're not going to really uh, uh, reduce inflation, right? If you do any kind of spending, right? If, if you want to blame the uh, inflation on spending, uh, the real way to lower it is to tax it out. And that's not going to happen, right? There is no 
appetite for raising taxes on the rich. I, I know that there is some sort of like IRS provision here. And I see people having fights on Twitter about this. Like, no, 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 this, this isn't going to lead to audits for like regular people. This is only for the rich. It's only for corporations. But I mean, there's no reason to assume that that's in fact what's going to happen, right? The IRS tends to, not because they're like full of bad people or whatever, but just with kind of like, uh, the means that are available to them, it, it, it's it's not it's not a matter of like oh we have to enforce the laws already on the books like that's the job of the IRS right they they simply enforce uh, the laws already on the books, but if the laws that are already on the books are simply laws that you know uh, make it so that it's legal right for um, like people to not pay taxes like I remember like people really upset when some of the kind of like more recent uh, Trump. Uh, income taxes came out and they saw that he was like barely paying anything. They're like, oh, what a piece of shit. But it's like, well, I mean, this was like part of an Obama era law that allowed Trump to pay as little as he did for like whatever those years were. It was like somewhere in the 2010s or whatever. Um, so uh, the issue as far as I see it is not merely you have to enforce the laws in the books. Like, I don't even know to what extent like people are, are breaking those laws. The biggest issue, right, the real reason why uh, we're not able to sufficiently tax money out is because the super rich uh, are very legally simply not paying, uh, you know, like whatever they ought to pay, right, outside of uh, the limits of the law, right? Um so, so uh, anyway, I feel a little uh, weird even calling it the Inflation Reduction Act, but uh, I, I'm going to continue calling it uh, for the sake of uh, this, uh, this, this, this video, right? And so one thing that has come out, as it always comes out, right, whenever we talk about, you know, like, are, are we getting everything that we need, everything that we want? Um, like, wh like, what do we mean by a good climate bill? Right. Um, in the same way that you could ask this question of what do we mean by the lesser of two evils? What do we mean by, you know, like Obama is good, Biden is good, Trump is bad? Well, what does good mean if good does not mean good enough? Right. Because you could something could be good, but that word, while it sounds nice, just like, you know, survivable sounds nice. That word, good, is meaningless if you have a certain object in mind. If the object is, for example, like why, you know, why vote for Democrats? Uh, if the object is you want Democrats to win again and again, not just 50% of the time, but 100% of the time, you can't simply be okay with something that's, uh, you know, like in a relative sense, compared to the alternative, compared to like literally total inaction on the part of Republicans, you can't simply say that something is good if good enough is the only thing that's going to get you reelected, right? If it's good that there was like, a, I don't know, a, like a $2,000 stimulus under Biden, right? If we could all agree that that was good uh, for people dealing with coronavirus, for people dealing with a lack of work, the question I would ask is, is it good enough with, with respect to winning multiple elections in a row uh, if, for example, you refuse to, I don't know, uh, pass a, a, a minimum wage hike, if you refuse to pass a public option, right? It was a, that was like the 2008 platform, right? And Democrats ran on the 2008 platform again in 2020. So if all these things are not being done, right? If it's not good enough for election after election, then calling it good, just like calling these provisions of like, you know, uh, this climate bill or whatever, survivable, right? Keeps us survivable. These are meaningless terms. They don't, they don't mean anything at all. They're just a way for you to feel good. They're for a way for you to, to play this kind of like culture war game, right? Um, it's perfectly fine, you know, to be survivable in the sense that, Billions of people are climate change refugees, and now everybody's living way up north. But that's not really what we're talking about, right? So to me, a good climate bill is one that has a ton of very specific metrics for the sake of hitting upon specific goals. If your goal ultimately is we need at a minimum to hit you know, the, the Paris uh, Accords uh, or whatever other metric, well, 
this climate bill does not meet those goals. Remember uh, uh, when Obama entered uh, the accords, um, you know, people at the time, they were so excited. They were like, oh my God, just like people are very excited now. Clim a lot of climate activists are excited about the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Uh, they're like, oh my goodness, you know, um, this is going to do this. This is going to, you know, slow down uh, 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 global warming. This is going to, uh, you know, sort of uh, be able to obviate the, the, the very worst uh, of these externalities. And, you know, like many years on, you know, it didn't seem to do much, right? Because because be, being non-binding, no one actually hit upon those goals, right? And it was like immaterial that Trump like pulled out, right? It didn't even matter because no one was going, you know, no one was on that trajectory to begin with. So if the very kind of like minimal standards set out uh, in Paris were already kind of like insufficient, Keep in mind that even by the metric of the, the Paris Accords and by the metric of Biden's own plans, right, back in 2020 when he was running, it doesn't even hit those goals, right? So what ends up happening again and again is we keep moving the goalposts, right? It used to be we need to hit the uh, Paris Agreement. Now, when we, you know, we, when we were in 2020, it was uh, the, you know, build back better plan. And now since we can't even do uh, uh, those specific uh, provisions that were laid out in 2020, we're going to cut back even that and then we're going to celebrate. But again, if you want to avoid three degrees, four degrees, are you setting yourself on that route, right? And if in combination with this bill, you're not passing enough stuff that the average person feels, right? So that you could get elected in 2022, in 2024, in 2028, and yet another Trump comes along and he acts as that, and he pulls out of this agreement, and suddenly this thing that already has like a, a bare minimum of teeth is defanged even further until it's now all that's left is just gums, what exactly are we talking about, right? Is this the reason why Iglesias feels the need to talk about survivable levels, right? Is this what it comes down to? Is this merely a, a way of protecting himself when what seems to me uh, the inevitable happens, right? If the inevitable is uh, uh, millions or billions or whatever the number is of climate change refugees and three degrees, four degrees is hit, is this just a way for him to be, you know, as an 80-year-old man, 90-year-old man, you know, a lot of these vampires, right, who knows uh, technology, how far, right, if you have sufficient money, if you have sufficient narcissism, who knows how long you could, you know, sort of like, you know, um, extend your lifespan, right? Maybe he's going to be a 125-year-old man saying, well, I did say survivable, right? Is this really all it comes down to? Is it, is it just narcissism, right? Is it just narcissism? Because if we're talking about objective metrics, we're not quite hitting those here. All we've done is shift the goalposts. These things that we said that were so important, now we seem to be saying, right, they're not important, right? And getting to the second part, global warming is nonlinear, right? Though the frame of reference is absolute, the degrees of change, right, one, two, three, four degrees, that is absolute. But what happens between one and two and three and four and five, that is nonlinear, right? Um, and there's also kind of like subjective quality to it that eventually finds an objective outlet. But, you know, I originally thought I was going to do that uh, Dostoevsky video outside, right? I was going to be walking down Jamaica Avenue, right, in Queens, you know, holding up my phone, just talking some shit about uh, Dostoevsky's idea of, of um, um, uh, what did he call uh, these uh, cities? Uh, uh, it wasn't the plant, no, intentional cities, right? Intentional versus uh, unintentional cities, right? And I was going to talk about how intentional Jamaica Avenue feels to me every time I walk down Jamaica. The fact that there's no tree cover, right? The fact that like you could be walking down and there's all these like stones that are about to like literally like you, you could trip on that shit right it could be like a huge intersection right a huge walkway right for people to walk on and there's like literally tons of bricks coming out that 
months and months pass, nothing is getting fixed. That is all intentional, right? And the reason why I didn't do it on Jamaica Avenue, do this video, is it was so goddamn hot the past few weeks, wasn't it? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm lucky enough that when I take my walks, for the most part, I could go under tons of tree cover, right? I could find places where there's tree cover, so I still have to like get out very early in the morning or late at night, but I could still find sufficient tree cover, right, and not absolutely bake as I'm walking. But it's just been so goddamn hot, and it feels like all of this is accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. Right in the last couple of years, we had like a couple of weeks in New York City where there was literally no sun at all, and the reason why we had no sun uh, is because there were wildfires going on a thousand miles away, right? And all that stuff found itself here, and these fires are getting worse, and these heat waves are are, are getting worse, and these flood events and these storms are getting worse. And they're not doing it in a linear fashion. All this stuff is multiplying, 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 right? All those people that died back in, like people talk about climate change refugees in the abstract, but it's already happening. All those people that died in what was the 2012 uh, in that uh, tsunami in India, right? To the extent that all those places became uninhabitable, we had like over 100,000 deaths, I believe it was the number. And millions of climate change refugees that had to go elsewhere. That's already happening, right? And of course, you could say, well, you know, it's not all climate change causing that. But even if you, you put, a, put a percentage to it, 25%, 50%, 75%, that makes it worse, right? Um, that is that percentage that you could blame on the climate, right? Um, and, and this is just multiplying very quickly. And I think the 2020s are going to be a decade where pe people are kind of like waking up now. Like even I feel like back in during the Obama years, it was still kind of like in the abstract. You know, Obama could be up there, could say like, we need, we need to reverse this. We need to do this. We need to, need to do that, right? But now like even some of the conservatives, right? They can't truly fight any of this, right? They can't say that this is just in the abstract, right? They see this going on. They see this happening. And... You know, uh, uh, it, it's again, it's not linear, right? It's getting worse and worse. Uh, like again, like in the past few weeks, like I, ha I have to leave the house like literally before seven o'clock every day to take my, I take like a long walk, like like a ninety minute walk. If I'm gonna be walking for ninety minutes, right? I can't be leaving the house like past like six thirty, right? It's, it's too damn hot. It's too much, and this is just gonna get worse. Right, so these like subjective feelings, these anecdotes that we're, that we're all collectively experiencing, they're gonna find objective outlets. We're gonna be able to measure all this stuff, and it's gonna get worse. Right, the twenty twenties are going to be this tipping point, and the point that I'm making is this climate bill. Right, you could say good because it's better than literal zero. Right, but we are uh, talking about the difference between billions of climate refugees, and again billions of climate refugees, right? Because the number that would be attenuated here is not going to be a factor of billions, right? You'll have billions here and you'll have billions there, but maybe with this bill, it's going to be a couple of million less, right? This is truly what we're talking about. These are the stakes, right? The, the stakes, again, as much as Iglesias wants to make himself feel better, as much as he wants to say as a 125-year-old vampire that I wasn't technically wrong, right? We could see through this. We're not dumb, right? Remember, we fucking went to public school. We know what it's about, right? Um, and we're not going to let the wool be pulled over our eyes. So uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, food and water watch. Um, so um, let me just inspect this element. Delete that. I believe that might be a, an image that I shouldn't show you guys. Um but uh, it asks basically like what what, what is uh, like what exactly is going on with the uh, IRA? Um, what did Mansion get out of it? What does it mean for the future? So just a, a quick note in Food and Water Watch. I've been a uh, I've been donating to Food and Water Watch for a couple of years. I think they're a great organization. They're a very transparent organization. When you look at um, in terms of like uh, the dollar for dollar effects that they have. 
right, in quantifiable ways. Like uh, uh, they're they're one of the best uh, um, charities in the United States that you could, or rather, it's not a charity, right? So it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, it, it's um, well, I mean, you know, charities are uh, technically nonprofits, but I wouldn't say they do charity work, right? They're they're working on policy, right? They're not just here to kind of like attenuate. Um, you know, people's uh, problems temporarily, right? They're trying to pass laws. And I mean, they don't have my politics, right? And I don't care about that. I don't care that they, you know, encourage people to vote for Democrats or whatever. You know, I don't vote for Democrats, but whatever, right? Uh, I, 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 I like the fact that, you know, um, uh, they're about not just uh, climate change, right? They're also about providing uh, uh, food, right? Providing a clean water, uh, ensuring that, there's like a, a level of environmental justice going on, right? So I would urge people to look into this organization, right? Um, and whenever, because specifically because they don't have my politics and they are willing to work with Democrats and they are willing to tell people to, you know, go vote, vote harder, blah, blah, blah. Um, when they start releasing something about like, a, you know, a new climate deal or whatever being, you know, being passed, or they write articles about what, what you know any administration is up to. I definitely read it right away, right? And, and I take it to heart, right? Because if someone who does not share my politics and is sympathetic to the Biden administration, whereas I am not, if they could have a negative view on something like the IRA, guess what? You better fucking listen up, right? Because um, uh, it, it, it's not really... It, it's not really... You know, it, it, it's 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 not it's not something that would make them feel good, right? Um, it, it, it's harder, right, to sort of like have maybe some of the assumptions that they share, um, if you know you're essentially uh, voting for people that are kind of like doing things against even your own personal agenda here, right? So, uh, anyway, I, I would urge you guys to check them out see what kind of articles they have whenever something uh, uh, gets uh, released, right? Do take it to heart. So this is what they have to say about uh, this, this, this law. After months of near misses and false starts, Senate Democratic leaders have announced the compromise spending package. If passed, the package would become the most significant investment in climate and energy spending in decades, totaling $369 billion over 10 years. The Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, was tailored to the liking of West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a coal millionaire who has made no secret of his preference for propping up the fossil fuel industry. The deal, which has still which still has several legislative hurdles, is essentially a slimmed-down version of the Build Back uh, Better Act. That version called for $555 billion in climate and energy spending when it was passed in the House. This bill provides much-needed support for clean energy. That much is true, but it comes with many concessions that advance fossil fuel interests and lock in a dangerous climate future. All right, so when it comes to climate action, much of the IRA is geared towards wind and solar credits. These credits would bolster private investment in renewables and clean energy manufacturing. The IRA would also increase the tax rebates associated with purchasing an electric vehicle. And the flip side, and by the way, um, these rebates, like, uh, I, I heard some rumblings when this was first released that this might not, not happen, but now it's kind of gone mainstream, right? That due to some of the provisions about like sourcing of uh, materials or, or whatever, um, these rebates might not kick in for, for a long time. So on the flip side, there are serious questions about whether the credits would actually apply to most car purchases. There are also funds for home energy improvements and environmental justice spending. However, advocates have criticized those provisions for failing for falling well short of the White House's own goals. So let's keep that in mind, right? The White House, the Biden administration had a bunch of metrics, a bunch of goalposts. These have officially shifted. Just like it shifted a decade ago, we continue to shift the goalposts. There are also some highly unappealing provisions, including billions dedicated to carbon capture and sequestration. CCS is the dirty energy industry's favorite false climate solution. There are also substantial investments in fossil-based hydrogen, though studies show little to no climate benefit over fossil fuels. Such policies would subsidize ineffective technologies that prolong the life of the fossil fuel industry. All right, keep in mind that the fossil fuel industry is pretty, it's overall, it's pretty happy about this, right? That's not to say that maybe you won't find some complaints, but there's a reason why everybody 
right, from that world is fairly happy with this. Even if it's as small as, well, it could have been a lot worse, right? The legislation also devotes billions to a methane fee. This fee would penalize companies that leak the potent greenhouse gas into the atmosphere from wells, pipelines, and other infrastructure. These leaks are not even currently measured or adequately monitored, so it remains unclear how this approach would work. As written, it amounts to a subsidy for fossil fuel companies in hopes that the penalty would lessen pollution. Right, and this is going to get more important later on. Right, uh, to the extent that everything here is just a bunch of incentive structures, it's not actually true public investment. Right, the legislation will increase fossil fuel development in several ways. It bizarrely requires the federal government to reinstate a massive oil and gas lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico. That sale was blocked by a federal judge in January. The deal also features a dirty for clean public lands trade-off. If the federal government wants to approve any new wind or solar projects in public lands or waters, it would first have to offer millions of acres of public land for oil and gas leases. The IRA reinforces the deluded idea that we can secure real climate victories by both ramping up clean energy and continuing to approve new fossil fuel projects. The last decade of energy development in the United States shows that clean energy doesn't displace fossil fuels on its own. In fact, we have grown both at the same time. Continuing this dual track is dangerous. It fools people that progress is happening when fossil fuels are still endangering our future. What's worse, to secure Manchin's IRA, IRA support, the Senate must consider a separate measure to expedite en energy infrastructure permitting. While this could help build badly needed transmission infrastructure for renewables, we can expect Manchin and Republican lawmakers to craft something primarily benefiting fossil fuel facilities and projects. Additionally, Manchin has strong armed cooperation from Senate Democratic leaders and the White House to finish the disastrous Mountain Valley Pipeline. This kind of so-called permitting reform has been a priority for the fossil fuel industry. That could explain why some dirty energy CEOs appear mostly pleased with the overall package. Obviously, the goal of any climate plan is to reduce climate pollution. IRA proponents argue it will work, citing models that predict a 40% reduction in carbon emissions by the year 2030. However, there are still massive caveats. First, it's not a 40% reduction in climate pollution. It's from the emissions recorded at a high point in 2005. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency's calculations, net emissions have already declined 21% between 2005 and 2020. Indeed, the models that now show a range of 31 to 44% reductions through the IRA also forecast that we would reduce emissions between 24 and 35 percent without passing any new climate policies. Moreover, the assumptions behind these models remain unclear. For instance, to what extent do they rely on carbon capture's promised results despite decades of failure, failures? Are they underestimating the impact on pollution from fracking on public lands? Right. So anyway, uh, especially like focus on this, like literally by doing nothing at all, right? Um, we're still slated, right? For a 24 to 35% reductions, right? So to the extent that this is 31 to 44%, this isn't all that much, right? You could celebrate all you'd like that this is good, right? It's good in the sense that it is in fact larger, especially if you consider in combination with the recent uh, uh, CHIPS legislation. It is good in the sense that it's larger than anything else in history. But to the extent that that is good, what that means to me is it has simply widened, right? That Overton window, right? As far as like what is permissible to discuss, what is permissible to pass? What is permissible to do? Uh, I do think that in the next uh, few years, uh, conservatives that maybe even were sort of like, you know, um, against climate spending or whatever, they're going to have to jump on the bandwagon, right, out of necessity because, you know, the world is kind of moving on uh, without them. And also just the fact that, you know, reality itself is catching up in very serious ways. Like, 
Uh, even even someone like um, Ron DeSantis of Florida, right? He might be uh, the no the Republican nominee in in twenty twenty four. And DeSantis has uh, spent at this point hundreds of millions in Florida on uh, uh, climate change solutions because you know while you know maybe someone in Nebraska or whatever the fuck could like you know LARP about uh, uh, you know climate change being a hoax and maybe you know DeSantis could publicly LARP about climate change being a hoax. I don't even remember what his public statements are. The fact is like Florida is really vulnerable to climate change, right? It is a fucking swamp. It's going to be sinking. It's going to be dealing with flooding. It's going to be dealing with storms, right? You're going to have to protect that ass, right? And DeSantis is, is trying to protect that ass with climate spending, okay? So if someone like that runs, right, um, uh, maybe we'll, you know, at, at a minimum, uh, not get this, uh, you know, IRA slimmed down in, in 2024 or whatever, you know, maybe that's not going to be the first order of business, uh, or maybe it will be slimmed down, but it'll be slimmed down in, in, in the sense that um, the Affordable Care Act was slimmed down, right? Meaning not totally overturned. Um, but, you know, this is exactly why, by the way, we need to always aim much, much higher, right? Even if you think that $555 billion is like, oh, that, that's way too much for climate, well, guys, just just give it a few years. Democrats are going to lose again because they're not passing the legislation that they need again, right? In order to win 100% of the time or even just 75% of the time, right? Because you can't do this 50-50 shit, right? And expect to, to make serious progress, right? 50-50 means the radical right-wing party, which is the Republicans, they're going to take your center-right legislation, and they're going to overturn it or they're going to combat it with their own legislation, right? This, this always happens again and again. So you need to do something better than a 50% win rate. And the only way to do that is you need to pass laws that people could actually feel, that they could love, that gives them a reason to actually vote for you, okay? So you aim high knowing full well that someone somewhere is going to A, repeal it. And that honestly at some point, like again, like what they're saying here is real, Right? Um, uh, to what extent do they rely on carbon capture's promised results despite decades of fail failures? We don't know what's going in in some of these calculations. There was, there was this one uh, a think tank called the Energy Innovation Fund. I was trying to find some information about them. I, I couldn't. I don't know if uh, you know. I don't know if they're like funded by by anybody. Like I don't know what's going on there. But uh, they did say something like uh, with this bill for every new ton of carbon emissions uh, that gets put into the atmosphere, you are required to take 21 tons out. Now, if this is in fact true, great. But w what is this actually based on, right? Um, it, it, are, are these technologies that we're talking about, are, are they even real? Is this still all, all theoretical? The other thing I would say is, you know, these provisions are primarily um, they're they're not they're not public investment in the way that I would think of as public investment, right? They're tax credits and they're other kinds of like incentive structures, okay? And granted, you know, uh, incentives do work. I mean, like you know, uh, if you put some kind of incentive in place, uh, it will have you know, given uh, given how random this works and given how you know numbers work. You know, you run a simulation with incentives uh, a thousand times versus a simulation without incentives a thousand times. The outcomes are going to be different. But we don't know to what degree these incentives are going to be tapped, right? I mean, there, there might be plenty of companies that, are, uh, that they feel like when they, when they look at their business model, when they look at uh, what, what they want to do, like, you know, there's, for example, you know, that, that methane penalty. Maybe a company would be like, you know what, maybe I'm going to, uh, like, let's assume that that methane penalty could actually be enforced, right? That's the first part, right? That's another part of these calculations that we don't know about. Let's say that that methane penalty could be enforced. You, you will definitely have a company somewhere out there that looks at that calculation and says, you know what, uh, if, even if I have to pay this penalty, I'm going to make more money if I pay the penalty and continue doing everything that I'm doing, right? That's not to say that everyone will be in that boat. But there's going to be at least someone in that boat, right? So that's going to erode, like all these, all this kind of guesswork, all these educated guesses that we're doing about extrapolating to the future, what this is going to look like. 
you know, we've already started, you know, moving the goalposts already with the $555 billion plan. Now we moved the goalposts further by bringing this down to under $400 billion. And these goalposts will shift once more when the reality of all this is going to, you know, start playing out as, okay, well, people aren't buying as many uh, energy, uh, like EVs as we thought. Some companies aren't doing this. Some companies don't care about that incentive, right? Um, and given the fact that all this that's happening is nonlinear, we might very well, given how sort of, uh, you know, how, how kind of like gummy, right? I said that we've been defanged, right? The gums is all that's left. Given the fact that climate change is so nonlinear, you might very well find yourself in as little as five to 10 years with all kinds of new crazy externalities that will completely upend so many of the assumptions within this bill, right? And, you know, I'm not just saying that just to kind of like poo-poo, like the greatest climate victory in history. I'm not just trying to do that. I'm trying to make you think of this with a kind of like wider, you know, historical context because this has historically happened again and again. There's no reason to assume that the celebrations that we had about Paris 10 years ago are going to play out any differently with the, uh, 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 you know, assumptions about here, right? So, um, uh, uh, it, it, another thing that, that I'm going to talk about is just like, uh, well, actually, l l let's just move on to this Jordan Weissman, right? Writing for, uh, writing for uh, Slate, right? So um, uh, Jordan Weissman is, did I get this thing? Yeah, got his name right. Jordan Weissman is uh, his, uh, one of the senior editors at Slate, right? You know what I feel about uh, journalists, right? Um, I can't quite say it on, on the channel, right? I might be... <sighs> Anyway, I won't even I won't even say what might happen if I say it because that might be grounds for, and I won't even say grounds for what because that itself might be grounds for. But anyway, uh, you know how I feel about mainstream journalism, and uh, so he's writing this in Slate: Why internet leftists are so pissed about Democrats' historic climate bill, and I want to set this against actual climate activists, right? Again, Food and Water Watch. I absolutely respect this organization, and I hope everybody watching this checks them out follows their work and perhaps even uh, becomes um, uh, a donor, right, to, to what they do. But um, so anyway, uh, I want to compare what they have to say uh, against this like random fucking editor somewhere, right, who has uh, uh, no stake anywhere, right, who is not going to be affected by the worst of these externalities, no matter what happens, again, even if he does become an Iglesias-esque, 150-year-old uh, uh, Dracula-type figure, right? He's most likely not going to be the one dealing with the worst of these externalities, right? And I, I found uh, the straw men in this article to be very kind of enlightening, and it just kind of shows how, you know, these people that, that constantly tell you things like, you know, I want to be reasonable here, guys. I want to tell you about the climate future, right? And I want to do it in a way that actually makes sense and actually, you know, um, uh, presents uh, something of value and something pragmatic, right? That's the crazy part. Like, I always hate that word pragmatism because, you know, what I always say is like, look, if your pragmatism is uh, uh, you're going to pass laws that will only have long-term teeth and long-term effects that are good enough, if you win 100% of the time, that's not very pragmatic, is it, right? Because the Democrats, let me tell you, they're not slated for a 100% win rate, right, in any kind of elections, right? They're not willing to do the hard work that would actually make th that sort of thing happen, right? If you want a sort of 20, 30 year, like Democratic Party fucking domination that we had like during FDR and after FDR to the point that even, you know, Republicans like, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Eisenhower, right? Like Eisenhower, like had all this like fucking public investment that you had to do simply because that was that was the Overton winner. That was the new norm, right? You couldn't you couldn't not do that if Democrats were doing that for such a long time, right? If Democrats were suddenly doing things of value for Black Americans, guess what? If you want Black Americans to have all vote for your Republican platform, you're gonna have to give them some goodies too, okay? Right, so we had like a multi-decade run of total Democratic Party domination, and I see that given the way things have played out, right, with kind of like you know corporations squeezing out the last bit of, 
you know, value from the world. And the only way to do that now is through ever, you know, uh, greater and greater tax cuts for them, which is why no matter who's in office, right, we either get a tax cut or we get nothing that's done, right? Um, uh, we're not in the position for 100% win rate. So that's not pragmatic, right? So this kind of like mealy mouth fucking pragmatism that is just exactly the opposite of pragmatism, right? Exactly the opposite of centrism. Let's uh, let, 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 let's see with this non-activist who has no stake and absolutely nothing in the world, with, world whatsoever. Let's see what he has to say. By and large, climate activists have agreed to the Inflation Reduction Act, which passed the Senate on Sunday as an imperfect but an undeniably big victory in the battle against global warming. I'm not, first of all, I'm not even sure about this first sentence. Like, is that is that even true? I mean, I'm sure uh, many are, right? Especially those that are very much wedded to the Democratic Party. Some of those are, but some of the um, biggest names that I know all right, he's going to talk about uh, Greenpeace, the uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Food and Water Watch, like one of the best, one of the literally fucking best organizations in America right now for the environment. They don't have this view, right? Um, right? Uh, th they're not simply saying it's imperfect. They're saying it's dangerous. They're saying this could be exactly what happened during the Obama years where all that nice talk and all those non-binding agreements and all that let's frack some more uh, and crater the price of oil to the point where now everybody's using oil. So it's like, who gives a fuck, you know, what you do in terms of like offsets, right? Um, a lot of these groups, right, already now we have, you know, something that might be a little misleading, right? Maybe I'm overstating things a bit, but perhaps he's overstating things a bit. They are thrilled about the roughly $370 billion it would spend to decarbonize the economy and promote green industries, even though they are frustrated by sections of the bill that will open up more federal lands to oil and gas development, which Democrats were forced to include in order to win the Senate's all-important swing vote mansion. But some have reacted to the compromise with more fury. The Center for Biological Diversity described those fossil fuel provisions as a climate suicide pact, while Greenpeace called them a slap in the face to the frontline communities, grassroots groups, and activists that made this legislation possible. It acknowledged that the rest of the bill was historic. So he doesn't uh, quite talk about this further on, but the reason why it's called a slap in the face to the frontline communities, grassroots group, whatever, whatever, is a lot of these provisions that he says are not worth, he is implying are not worth this fury, they are provisions that, as always, are going to act as a regressive tax on the most vulnerable communities in the world. Earlier today, I was reading an article about the externalities of uh, even, you know, like even if you say that EVs are going to be ultimately good for the world, the externalities that they're talking about going on in places like Burma right now, people are literally dying due to, uh, you know, these like mining cartels, right? They're the ones that have to bear those costs. No one in these kinds of provisions are like, okay, let's, you know, let's, uh, um, you know, let, 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 let's find ways to get these minerals out of the ground. They're not also at the same time providing you know, uh, um, some kind of funding for groups that are going to be absolutely clobbered, right? And murdered by these provisions, right? They, as always, as always, the global South is bearing the brunt of what we say that we got to do for the world, for the planet, right? It used to be India, you know, extracting trillions upon trillions upon trillions of value from India, right? By Britain through various tax schemes and you know, just various, various like imperial, imperial uh, antics, right? So that hasn't changed. We're still doing that in America. Many of these pipelines, right? They're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be affecting West Virginians, right? They're gonna be affecting uh, Native Americans who already are, right, in the kind of like, you know bottom of the barrel in terms of life outcomes in, in America. And yet again, you know, we have more and more of these uh, regressive taxes for the good of the planet, right? So. Uh, let's not understate what we're talking about here, right? We are talking about human sacrifices for the good of the world, which those that are being sacrificed, they're not being given anything. Their families aren't being offered anything for these sacrifices. No one is asking for their consent, right? It's just being done, 
And by the way, but Iglesias, he's not, you know, he's not against this. He actually wrote an article back in 2013. It was something like um, places like Bangladesh have terrible like working conditions and safety standards. And that's actually a good thing, right? And the reason why he's saying it's a good thing is, you know, it's good that these people have the choice to, you know, become maimed essentially uh, in exchange for like a little bit of money, right? Because uh, some people, if you say like, hey, you know, let me uh, torture and rape you and then cut off your arm and make that into a snuff video and I'll give you $500,000. There's a lot of people that would, you know, willingly four or $500,000 be raped, right? Um, uh, be tortured, right? And have their arm ch chopped off, and then have their face in this uh, uh, a snuff video uh, forevermore, right? So, but he's saying it's it's good, right? It's a it's good that people could have that kind of choice, right? And of course, like if we're talking Bangladesh, right? The choice is not five hundred thousand dollars, right? It's 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 you get maimed, and uh, you're able to maybe no longer have to make the choice between medicine and food. Now you could finally have both, right? These are the kinds of things we're talking about, right? And of course, deeper context with this means, I mean, he was, a, I believe, like a philosophy major in Harvard, right? Um, the, the kind of wider philosophical implications here. It's, it's kind of funny how uh, he's not using this like uh, really, really wonderful education that he's accumulated to even like these d discuss these questions in a kind of more substantive way. But anyway, we are talking about uh, essentially human sacrifices here, right? So some have reacted to the compromise with more fury. Right? On Twitter, a portion of the internet poisoned left, right? This is what we're talking about, the internet poisoned left. Right? We're not talking about, you know, the Obama poisoned uh, centrists. We're not talking about the Biden po uh, poisoned centrists. We're not talking about those who were poisoned, right, at Dalton School. Those that were poisoned at Harvard, right? We're talking about the internet poison left has already written off the legislation as a giveaway to oil and gas interests that will do little to help the climate. That course has been fed or rather led by figures like director Adam McKay, who directed uh, the recent climate Jeremiah Don't Look Up and his screenwriting partner in the firm uh, in the film, former Bernie Sanders aide David Sirota, who recently tweeted, Dear fucking idiots, climate change doesn't care whether your favorite political party gets a win. It doesn't care whether your favorite MSNBC pundit is happy. It can only be stopped by actually reducing emissions, not by expanding oil drilling. Sincerely yours, uh, physics. Sanders himself also savaged parts of the bill from the Senate floor this weekend before ultimately supporting it. Now, I, I found this funny, right? I was just checking Twitter, uh, rather Reddit. Uh, which is like very, very normy uh, politically to see uh, what the opinion was. So this was a submitted about a week ago. Uh, Bernie Sanders knocks Schumer and Manchin's big climate and health care bill, calling it the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And out, out of curiosity, I just wanted to see what people would say now that Biden is in office, right? Because uh, our politics, right, the subreddit is very very, very like a normie uh, Democrat, right? Although, you know, when 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 Bernie was uh, running to their credit, right, they were all kind of like mostly pro-Bernie. But when it came down to uh, Trump versus Biden, it was always like, you got to vote, you got to vote, you got to vote for Biden, blah, blah, blah. So this is the first comment. Check this shit out. Dear Bernie, now is not the time. Let's stomp out the extreme right first. And I don't know how how old this fuckwit is, right? But I I'm old enough to remember 2020, right? This was a mere two years ago, when back then I was told and everybody else was told, dear whoever, dear voter, now is not the time. Let's stomp out the extreme right first, right? We were hearing this shit back in 2020. Now Joe Biden is in office. We have the Senate. We have the House. And yet again, something that is not just imperfect, but very potentially dangerous and, you know, you know quite frankly, could be absolutely, you know, um, counter to what you even want to do. Right? It could be totally counter to, to uh, the sort of like long-term goals that we want to put in place. They're not even willing to talk about this. They're not even willing. And this, this is the highest voted fucking comment, okay? They're not even willing in this pro-Bernie subreddit to discuss this any further, right? Because yet again, just like in 2020, we got to stomp out fascism. 
Yet again, in 2024, you're going to hear the same shit. 2026, 2020, it doesn't matter what's going on, right? Even if we do end up in the worst case scenario and everybody is, you know, speaking a Canadian dialect of English or they're speaking Russian, right? Everybody's living far, far north. Even if we end up getting to that point, you're still going to get most likely some kind of scenario, right? Where you have actual leftists and you have a kind of status quo figure, right? Like Iglesias or whoever it might be, um, and a status quo party. You're going to have the same conflicts, the same arguments, the same stupidity, in the same way that you had the same exact shit back in the you know mid 1800s when you know so-called liberals were voting for uh, 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 like Whig party candidates that were slave owners because at least okay, fine, they are slave owners. We get it. Slave owning is bad, but look, they're saying maybe they want to possibly get rid of slaves. Uh, who knows? Maybe right. So. Of course, you know, what had to happen was those parties had to die out, right? Um, but you're going to get the same kind of discourse even in the worst case scenario. Like, that's the thing. Like, I don't, you know, that's kind of like the, 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 the sad part, right? I, I don't even think, like, I know like a Benjamin Studebaker and others are kind of like thinking a climate catastrophe might uh, or maybe probably will lead to some sort of a, a revolution, Honestly, I'm not even sure if that's going to happen, right? Um, uh, we, we might have to have that kind of St Steven Pinker-esque, you know, beating, uh, bashing your head into the wall. But sure enough, little by little, maybe some things, maybe not for the entire planet, not for the climate refugees, not for the, you know, species that you are uh, turning extinct, because of course it doesn't matter, right? Iglesias will tell you that first, right? Um, but maybe little by little, in some way, certain things are going to get better, right? So you're going to get this kind of argument right from the very beginning, right? And, and, and look how this argument evolves. He can say what he wants. He's going to vote for it. And then someone else jumps in. I mean, that makes it even more infuriating. He knows the bill isn't going to be changed. So he's literally just giving the Republicans free soundbite to plaster the airwaves three months before critical elections. Like people read this shit and they think like, oh yeah, like, they're making good points, right? Like, I mean, these like shell, like these like sheltered ass, like it's there's, it really is just like talking to children, isn't it? It doesn't matter whether you're a forty-one year old Iglesias, or a hundred and fifty year old Dracula, or an eighteen year old in college, right? It it all is just like talking to fucking children, right? Again and again, we're just talking to kids, right? So, like, we're not even supposed to talk about Sanders' critique because we're going to give her... Like, what Like, what the fuck are you... Like, you're so scared of everything. And the reason why you're so scared of it is simply because you know Democrats will always do what is insufficient, right? They're never going to pass anything that's going to get everybody on their side. We're not going to get another 1936 FDR event where suddenly a huge group of people that were skeptical now have no choice but to vote for you because guess what? If you have universal health care, you feel that shit. If somebody takes that away, you feel that shit. If you have a minimum wage hike from uh, uh, 725 to 15, you feel that shit if you've been working those kinds of jobs. And if someone says they want to take it away, you're going to feel that too. So in lieu of having any of that, and they know the Democrats are going, aren't going to, uh, uh, you know, pass legislation like this. They're saying because of that, because it's so scary, because we're always on the brink of failure, right? Even when we're in power, even when we have total power, we're always going to be on the brink of failure, right? We're not going to talk about it. Even when people say shit like, oh, no, 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 get 10 more senators on board, right? Get more 10 Democratic Party senators, and then we could do whatever we want. I'm not so sure about that. Because from what I recall, when we put a minimum wage hike, $15, right? That's like a bare fucking minimum. By inflation and productivity alone, it should be much higher than $20 an hour at this point, right? Compared to, uh, um, you know, half a century past. When that came to a vote, the bare fucking minimum from $7.25 to $15. When that came to a vote, eight Democratic party senators voted against it, right? That's a fact. So if you're not going to do the bare minimum, 
you're not going to tell me that by getting eight more of you guys, you're finally going to do this thing, right? This critical, critical thing. And that's the thing. Like That's the, that's the scariest part about all this, right? If you do end up, let's say, with like 65 Democratic Party senators, if under in that situation, you don't do that FDR style plan, deal, whatever, if you don't have that in place, you you totally, totally lose all goodwill, right? Because you made all these promises, if only, if only, if only, right? In the same way that like Biden, you know, prior to like the last couple of months, like, like polls worse than Trump two years in, right? Not even two years in. What am I even talking about? We're, you're talking like a year and a half in, right? Polls worse than Trump. And they promised so much. They promised so much in 2020. And then when it came to like, you know, electing Warnock, if we only get Warnock, finally, we will, you know, we will, uh, we will give you everything that we've ever promised and everything that you've ever wanted and everything that you didn't even know that you wanted. And we, could, we couldn't even get a minimum wage hike, right? We, we got a stimulus check and we got inflation. Um, and again, like I'm not an inflation hawk, but if you progressively get less and less in exchange for inflation, uh, that is a problem, right? That, at that point, things like Bitcoin suddenly now have a reason to exist, right? You could shit on Bitcoin all you want, but, the, but if you as the party, you as a liberal are okay with increasing inflation and progressively giving people less and less and less forward, guess what? People are going to start moving their money their lives, their energy, their attention to anything, anything that could even be like a pretend kind of like synthetic scarcity, right? Because that's just how things work, okay? If all you get is debasement, we're going to move to something that doesn't debase. And if you hate it, you better give it a reason to not exist, right? You can't give, you can't keep giving reasons for things to exist and then shit on those things when they come to fruition, right? Anyway, so some of this rage is just knee-jerk resentment toward the Democratic Party that's endemic among the online left with a dose of algorithm adult clout chasing added in for fun. But setting aside the Sorotin histrionics, I think it's important to recognize that with the success of the IRA, some of the most dedicated climate activists really have lost the basic philosophical battle over how best to combat climate change. This is yet to be seen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but compared to even 10 years ago, just subjectively how New York City feels to me, how I have to literally regulate my fucking behavior, my walks. I have to leave the house at a certain time because it's getting worse and worse. How other people are feeling that maybe don't have air conditioning. How people are literally by the thousands dying of heat strokes. Right? This remains to be seen. What do you mean they lost any kind of philosophical battle? If the philosophical battle was good, if it's not good enough, it's simply going to be insufficient and we don't want it. And yet, year after year, more wildfires. It's hard to literally exist outside. People are dying in storms. We have 100,000 corpses in India. If this is what's happening and you're, you're saying that we're losing a philosophical, like on what grounds? Maybe on the grounds that you, that you, Jordan Weissman, are not feeling it really. Maybe you don't leave the fucking house. I mean, you know, Iglesias, I'm not sure if he, you know, uh, uh, likes to hike, but uh, honestly, looking at his photos, it doesn't look like it. Maybe these people don't fucking feel it, right? Maybe they don't have to leave the house. Maybe, you know, they don't have to ever be in the global south. Maybe uh, they're not the type that will be swept away by a fucking tsunami, Right? But to say that philosophically they have lost something, I mean, on what basis are we saying this? On what basis is this a factual statement? It seems bullshit to me. If I simply look at the evidence all around, when I look at all the evidence around me, this seems like it's total bullshit. In the end, there are essentially four main ways that a country can cut back in greenhouse gas emissions. It can put a price on carbon using schemes like a carbon tax or cap and trade system. It can simply force businesses and utilities to emit less via regulations. It can try a supply-side approach by shutting down the development of new fossil fuels in order to increase their costs. 
or it can just throw money at the problem by subsidizing cheap renewables so that they could take over the market. Climate groups have tended to advocate for some mix of all these approaches, but the most hardcore corners of the movement are deeply attached to supply-side solutions. They've spent years on efforts to keep fossil fuels buried and stop the construction of new oil and gas infrastructure, such as the lengthy battles against the Dakota Axis and Keystone XL pipelines, as well as efforts to limit fracking. In the, pra in the process, keep it in the ground has become an international ra rallying cry. Again, if you fucking pay attention to what's going on around you literally this summer, right? There's a reason why keep it in the ground has uh, uh, some merit, right? And why uh, it's a popular rallying cry. Meanwhile, a whole branch of climate activism is now devoted to the idea that the feds could use financial regulations to bar oil, gas, and coal companies from private capital in order to stop them from drilling and mining. The supply-side approach to climate advocacy has always seemed to involve a dose of moralism, a sense that fossil fuels are inherently immoral and ought to be cut off wherever possible. At the same time, it also makes rational sense from the standpoint of activists who are concerned about the ecological and health impacts of oil and gas drilling, especially for poor and minority communities beyond their pure climate-related dimensions. Uh, and heading into the bottom, okay, anyway, let me let me uh, just talk about this th this part here, right? So he's talking about the flaw to the supply side approach, right? And, and, I, and I hate these like fucking euphemism. This is such a like an Inglesius kind of fucking thing, survivable, right? Um, supply side approach. Let's, let's be, let's be real about what we're talking about. Like stop trying to use wonk fucking language for what we're talking about. We need to stop the dependence on oil. We need to stop as quickly as we can, these emissions, right? We can't do it through some of these schemes that are part and parcel of all, all these models that seem to not be working out, despite the fact that they keep being put into further models, right? For people to then celebrate needlessly, right? Let's let's talk about what it is. Like stop 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 calling a supply side. Like it's like when people talk about abortion, right? Pro, like pro choice. Like fuck that, right? I mean, th there's no need for these euphemisms. Right, this is good for wonks. Right, who the fuck even reads this shit? Who reads Slate? Right, there's always been one extremely obvious and critical flaw with the supply side approach to combating climate change. However, most people absolutely hate it when gasoline and electricity prices go up, and tend to get angry at politicians who are in power when it happens. If a president says outright he's going to keep oil and gas in the ground. There is a strong chance that Americans will vote for someone who will promise to take it out of the ground and who won't do much else to deal with the impending climate catastrophe, right? So the reason why I find this so uh, – um, uh, okay, the reason why I find this so kind of like slippery and so – well, first of all, part of it, like you, you can't, you can't deny it, right? Like, uh, people don't like to see gasoline prices go up, right? They don't want to see electricity go up, and they will vote for Republicans if they say, "See what, see what Democrats did." I mean, they were like willing to vote for uh, Republicans uh, as early as two months ago because see what Democrats did—they created this inflation problem, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I understand that, right? There's not, and there's nothing wrong with uh, talking about that in terms of like strategy, pragmatism, blah blah blah, whatever, right? The problem with this is this assumes that the status quo, as done by Democrats, right, um, is perfectly acceptable in the sense that, well, why are we so dependent on gasoline? Well, that's because we don't have a proper infrastructure for public transit, right? In New York City, I don't ever have to drive because, I mean, I have very good public transit, but most people don't have it that good, right? The New York City system is among uh, the best in the world, right? It's, uh, I believe, the only major 24-7 uh, system, right? It never shuts down. Um, and most people don't have access to that, right? Uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the, cl the climate provisions uh, in this uh, bill do have, uh, do have like something for public transit, but it is primarily like tax incentives, right? That's still what we're talking about. We're not talking about the public investment that I want. We're not talking about building 
you know, bullet trains or whatever, right? Connecting every state, right? We're not talking about making public transit so cheap that nobody wants to drive and so easy that nobody wants to drive. We are talking about as always, you know, we're going to keep getting highway expansions. We're going to keep having a kind of like car centric future, right? And we're going to hope and pray that all these EVs, um, you know, can in the process sacrifice enough people from the global south as we extract all these minerals fast enough that everything could be EV, everything could be EV, everything could be EV, right? This is essentially what we're waiting for, right? So we're not getting anything really to attenuate this problem, right? This is what the pragmatists are doing, right? They're saying, I am pragmatic. I don't want to make the cost of gasoline spike because I want to win elections. Well, great. But if you believe that gasoline long-term is a problem, and if you believe the Democrats need to win again and again, if those two things are true, don't you want to actually do things to make gasoline long-term unnecessary? And don't you actually want to pass legislation that people will viscerally feel, okay? Because if it turns out to be true that the majority of this, um, you know, the tax payments here will be, you know, people that are getting audited who are, you know, like regular earners or whatever, right? If you look at a map of who gets audits, right, in terms of like a poverty rate versus auditing rate, it is almost literally the same map, right? It's going around Twitter the last few days, right? You could search for it, you could find it. If this is what's happening and people feel like beat up, right? And your party is, again, back to winning only 50% of the time. That's going to be a problem for your pragmatism, not only in terms of winning elections, but also in terms of uh, the place of gasoline long term, right? So if you actually want something to happen here, you need public investment that is true public investment, right? You don't want these survivable levels, bullshit euphemisms, right? And you don't want this kind of like, um, like, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like a deflating kind of uh, words, right? This like critical flaw in the supply side of it. Like, you, you don't want to listen to this kind of nonsense. And you can't in the same breath make a bunch of statements like this and also finish by saying who won't do much else to deal with the impending climate catastrophe. We're not doing anything, right, uh, in terms of uh, this impending climate catastrophe, right? Because this thinking that uh, uh, Weissman is, is saying is kind of like the mature adult approach. Guess what? Obama totally dumped the price of oil, totally dumped the price of natural gas. And guess what the effect of that was? He did win a second election because of it, or rather part of it, whatever you know that you want to, whatever percentage you want to ascribe to that. The fact is it helped his election prospects. This is true. But where are we now? Like, like long term, what exactly, what, what was the benefit here, right? You won an election, but guess what? Because of all this other stuff that I'm talking about in the context, like what about this public investment? What about this infrastructure? What about like a mass federal job guarantee where all of the jobs are about one thing only, which is climate-based infrastructure, right? Because that didn't happen in 2009, because that didn't happen in 2012. Guess what you were, were vulnerable to in 2016? You were vulnerable to your own fucking statistical, what you would call statistical anomalies. To me, it seems like it's statistically predictable that you will not win 100% of the time. No matter how you feel, no matter how deserving you think you are, you're not going to win 100% of the time. You're going to win at best, at best, 50% of the time, okay? And you did that to yourself. You did that to yourself by talking about gasoline. We need to make it cheap. We need to make it cheap because the only thing that matters is an election, right? And you have this carrot. Oh, it's also a stick, by the way. And you dangle it while beating someone in the ass with it at the same time. And you say, no, no, no. Vote for us because if you don't, the other guy is not going to do anything about the impending climate catastrophe, okay? You could have done a federal job guarantee, right? 
you could have not simply made gas cheap for the hell of it. Maybe, like, listen, maybe that could be a part of it. I'm not even against entertaining those notions. But when I see again and again, this notion is the notion that gets entertained at the expense of actual infrastructure being built out. Sorry, I'm going to call bullshit, right? All I see is profiteering. I don't see a long-term solution. Okay, so anyway, we don't have to go any further here. Um, let me, let's just like, so Stephen Semler, he's also a, a guy that is worth reading. I, I uh, support his, um, uh, like, uh, he has like a, a security kind of, uh, I'm not sure if I call it a think tank or something, but I mean, he, he releases like, a, um, a, you know, like articles or whatever from it. Um, definitely a worth your read, worth your support. Uh, he's recently been talking about Israel-Palestine. He's talking about uh, the fact that uh, under Biden, right, we've had this like total acceleration of uh, funding police departments, uh, sending them military-grade equipment, right, stuff that was never supposed to happen, right, even faster than under Trump, for example, right? And, and he wrote this article, Climate Funding of the Inflation Reduction Act. And basically, uh, he... Um, uh, he comes to the conclusion that the IRA is projected to make, right? But, but these are best case projections, right? We're, we're not talking about some of those other negatives and possible externalities. The IRA is projected to make a 7 to 9% improvement in emissions reduction over existing policy, right? And it's also pushing uh, the, the, the uh, uh, goalpost, right? In terms of what Biden originally said that he wanted to do, Right. And the funny thing here is like per year, like assuming that it gets passed as it is and, and uh, you know, nothing gets cut out of, uh, out of it like long term, it is still literally like 4%, right? It is 4% of um, uh, the Pentagon budget, right? And the Pentagon, right, the U.S. military is uh, by far in terms of like institutions, groups, whatever you want to call it, one of the biggest polluters on the planet. Right, so you're funding them to. This is, by the way, an all-time high. This is an all-time high in, in in what the Pentagon is getting. Biden is doing it uh, higher uh, than than Trump did. Right, Trump was supposed to be this like security-focused freak, right? But uh, instead, Biden is the one that even gave like a more let's call it patriotic number. And this is this is four percent, right? I mean, so like per like what, what did um, uh, uh, Elon Musk want to pay for Twitter? It was something like. 40 something billion per year the world uh, allegedly the world's leading environmentalist was willing in order to stroke his own ego in narcissist narcissistic fashion he wished to pay more for twitter for no re for no discernible reason whatsoever what the fuck is he getting involved in this shit for the world's leading environmentalist he was willing to pay more for twitter than what we're getting per year right, and climate uh, uh, change funding here, right? So, I mean, this, this is essentially where we are, right? I mean, like, look at China, right? China, uh, as of 2021, uh, I mean, even with the funding that we're getting now, it's still going to be um, spending roughly twice as much as we pay, right, for climate change. Now, granted, like, people say, well, they are a kind of disproportionate polluter, blah, blah, blah. This is true, but I mean, China is just running very, very quickly, right? A warp speed through everything that America ran through, everything that, you know, the Western powers were able to enjoy for a long time. China uh, wishes to uh, enjoy uh, those same, you know, improvements in the standard of living, the same improvements in GDP, right? And they're doing it at warp speed. And they're saying, you know what, if we're doing it at warp speed, at the very least, uh, we could spend more on the climate, Right. And we, the wealthiest nation on the planet, the nation that is supposed to teach the world about the liberal rules-based order, right? This is what we're doing. Even if you throw in this, even if you throw in the uh, uh, the chips law, right? We're still going to be trailing what China is doing, right? So uh, I want you to put all these numbers in perspective, right? I want you to think about what's going on. I want you to think about the narratives, right? And the words that are being used by people like Jordan Weissman, right? The, the way that they deflate certain scenarios, the way that they inflate other scenarios. I want you to think about, you know, what Matthew uh, Iglesias' uh, deal really is, right? What, what is his deal? Why does he use terms like survivable levels? Very, very weird, right? For someone that really understands climate change as well as he thinks that he understands it. 
to come out with a tweet to talk about survivable levels of climate change. Some, something, something is not adding up, right? Either someone is lying or someone is ignorant or there is some kind of uh, in-between scenario going on. But something here about the IRA and about these um, Twitter personalities, because again, these are essentially Twitter personalities, something about them is not adding up. Anyway, thank you guys for uh, sticking through this entire video. The website is automachination.com for all of your literary needs, patreon.com slash automachination. If you want to support the work of this channel, if you want to support my writing, if you want to support automachination.com, best way to, to do that is through the Patreon. You get a ton of uh, stuff. You get exclusives. Uh, I already have a few videos up. We just opened up the Patreon. We already have a few things up. We're going to have more things up uh, this weekend, more things up next week, the week after. We're going to keep pushing through, guys, until Maddie uh, is uh, nothing more than a footnote to one of my footnotes in this empire that I'm building. Thank you, guys.